It's not unfair to say that Dawn of War 2's reception was mixed. When you look at opinions at the time, they really go to show how much it stuck out compared to its peers. It didn't really fit into any camp, and with it wearing the odd socks of RPG mechanics and real-time strategy, I don't know what pair of shoes it was trying to fill. But it turns out there was an audience for Dawn of War 2. The game was lauded with praise for its originality, and yet again thousands were drawn to the Warhammer universe by Relic's depiction of the 41st millennium. The game was missing a lot though. Maps, modes, extra units, and races from Warhammer 40k, including a very important one to the IP's identity. In 2010, Relic re-delivered with Dawn of War 2 Chaos Rising. Chaos Rising would be the winter assault of the second game, adding a new campaign, new playable race, more weapons and units, and the best part of winter, aside from the lack of bugs. Relic has this weird thing for winter-themed sequels, I'm honestly surprised Homeworld 2 wasn't a Christmas special. Hopes were high for Chaos Rising after Relic's previous track record, so would they be able to release another wave of excellent expansions and be a dark godsend for spiky boys and frost fanatics everywhere? I don't know, but I'm tired of putting my minis in the freezer, so it'll have to do for now. The nightmare of the Tyranid invasion has ended, but only one year later, the Blood Ravens would awaken to a new one. The former Imperial world of Aurelia suddenly emerges from the warp, broadcasting a Blood Ravens distress signal. And when Vanilla Ice and the Retribution Institution rush out to answer it, they find Aurelia is now a frozen waste covered in grouchy guardsmen. The squad gets ambushed while insurgencies break out across Meridian, and it isn't long before the Chaos Forces of the Black Legion make themselves known as the perpetrators. Leading the warband is Aragast the Pillager, glory-hungry and corn-inclined, as well as someone with a personal grudge towards the Blood Ravens, Eliphas the- Eliphas! I fucking love that guy! Oh, come on, let me see him! Let me hear those sultry tones again! What? That's not. Th th that's a different guy! Th th that's a. a. cowboy man! Space Marines are after only one thing, and that's to kill Chaos, so the Strangers of Paradise drop everything to tackle the Black Legion, only to discover someone is helping Aragas from within their own ranks. There is a traitor in the chapter. From there, the plot thickens further. Characters thought Long Dead suddenly return, orders from Chapter Command ask you to stop engaging the Black Legion, and the crew grows frustrated and desperate as they try to stop Aragast and solve the mystery behind the traitor. Continuity is something Dawn of War 2 values a lot. Winter Assault, Dark Crusade, and Soulstorm were all standalone stories from one another, with very little to connect them, besides Gorguts and Toldair. Chaos Rising being a direct sequel means that all the previous characters return, facing an enemy that manipulates their good intentions, and preying on the world views and desires we learnt about them in the last game. Killing is all we are good for. The rest is delusion. Maybe. But I will cling to hope for a while longer, I think. And if the secrets of the chapter cost me that, I will still stand with my brothers. All of them. I don't know about that. Even the references to Dawn of War 1 get more staying power. Characters talked about Cronus or Kaurava as part of their past, but here they're used to tie a character's actions into the scheme of the Black Legion and the Traitor Marine. Their conversations are also integrated more naturally into this game. Your teammates can give advice on an upcoming mission, while some may have additional comments after the debriefing. And hell, it's nice to see characters like Gabriel and Eliphaz back from Dawn of War 1, even if he's relegated to being the Black Legion Starscream. Oh uh, yeah, that casting's making more sense. Chaos Rising is about half the length of its predecessor with a lot of padding removed. You're no longer capturing shrines, arrays, or factories to obtain global bonuses, and the frequent missions to defend these structures or to eliminate a target have been replaced with only a few side missions. The original's early game was necessary but drab. Some basic weapons take forever to drop while boss fights were at their most sluggish when you had very few combat options. Chaos Rising starts you at what used to be Dawn of War 2's endgame, so you've got plenty of tools at your disposal while your heroes are only getting scarier. Especially with features such as Tarkus' multi-grenade and whatever the fuck Thaddeus managed to do here, Jesus Christ. You can even carry over a previous save file to Chaos Rising, letting you use all the equipment and abilities you specced into previously, though your Terminator armor was broken by someone in the librarian. Heck, at this level, I ended up making use of my melee avatar's build. I did this as a joke, but once you fix his Terminator armor, he hits like a freight train. Believe it. There's a few new utility items as well, though some of the best ones from the original game remain irreplaceable, while some new weapons also bolster your arsenal. Melter guns, las cannons, lightning claws, even a grenade launch of Osiris. But the greatest addition to your arsenal is a new squadmate, the librarian Jonah Orion. 
Jonah is a very versatile unit who can support your team with his psychic powers, able to provide healing while making his allies harder, better, faster, stronger. Jonah can be a great damage dealer too with some incredible spells, but I personally found him at his best in melee, especially using his telefrag ability. You will need to keep an eye on him since he's awfully fragile, but that's okay. I'll just give him a new psychic hood, and while I'm at it, let's get the others in some new armor too. Oh, Alright, this one looks pretty good. Oh. Introducing a new mechanic. With frequent exposure to the blasphemous powers, missions may see you have to make sacrifices to achieve victory, such as neglecting your allies or damaging holy sites. So if you complete the mission but fail to protect the people of the sector and the relics of your chapter, your squad will stray toward darker influences. Corruption points do unlock new traits for your units though, as well as some very useful global abilities, so maybe Thaddeus can have a little bit of heresy, since he's been good. You may also find war gear in your battles which provide corruptive or redeeming properties, alongside mission conditions which can affect the way that you usually play. Choosing corrupted war gear can be tempting, it's typically more powerful than your normal weapons and in some cases can be upgraded continuously. By contrast, items which reduce corruption may be a deliberate handicap, which makes it harder to keep those units alive, but staying pious can pay off later. That being said, I did do pure and fully corrupted playthroughs of this game, and didn't feel any more powerful with the latter until I was about to face Aragast. Chaos Rising isn't a cakewalk, but you're already pretty strong. The game's generous with redemption opportunities anyway, and sometimes the one trait you get for staying pure may be better than the six you can get for… sitting around for 20 minutes? In fact, often the best way to grow corruption is to ignore optional objectives and let heresy grow from idleness, which probably wasn't intentional. I mean, in this case, it's a bit too literal. Imagine having a quiet weekend at home and waking up looking like this. Still, this is a really cool feature. Chaos is more than just a story beat or a unit on the map, but rather a full-blown mechanic you're tackling. And the way- No, not like that. Like a mechanic, not a mechanic. You're- why are you building a turret? The dark deeds you can willingly commit weigh heavy on the characters, who often comment their concerns about what you've made them do, and how you manage the system is crucial to uncovering the identity of the traitor. Commander, a recent campaign on Aurelia has revealed there to be a traitor among our ranks. It could be any one of us, Commander. Thaddeus, Cyrus, Avatus, emerge from beneath their beds now. Tarkus. Jonah, even the captain. So who do you think it could be, Commander? Dawn of War 2's depiction of the Tyranids as alien horrors was great, but something always felt missing from the base game. Something wicked, gothic, sinister in a familiar way. Hey, give over! Chaos are a heavy infantry army supported by demons and magic. Your choice of hero presents an inclination to one of the dark gods of Chaos, with the Chaos Lord playing ball with corn at lunch, the sorcerer crunching in the library with Zinch, and the plague champion catching Nurgle's cooties. No Slanesh hero though. Probably skipped class after chugging too many Jaeger bombs. The Chaos Lord is a brute strength melee fighter, much like the Orc Warboss or Force Commander. The sorcerer is an ability heavy caster, while the plague champion is able to equip several different weapons while healing or buffing anyone around him. I love that his flamethrower spews rancid gas, and being quite slow, he doubles as a defense hero, which I guess explains what he's doing here. This choice of hero extends further than just themselves, however, as the marks of Korn, Nurgle, or Zinch also affect your global abilities and the shrines your heretics can make. I was rather surprised by them in this game. They were shrill fodder in Dawn of War 1, but this version is like its cooler older brother, granting worship buffs or blowing themselves up to scare the shit out of the AI. Space Marines and Chaos Marines were fairly versatile in Dawn of War 1, one of them was just Hornier, but now both factions are specialised, with Chaos's weapons spread across more units, although most of them can just say fuck it and spec into close combat if they want. Dawn of War 1's roster was great, and I'll take the Defiler over the Chaos Dreadnought any day, but Chaos was very corn centric with horrors being the only odd one out. Chaos comes across as more undivided in this game, and I love the Great Unclean one, throwing units around, using his intestines like a grapple hook, and spewing all over the floor after chugging too many Jaeger bombs. There are spoils for the existing factions as well. The Space Marines and the Orcs get the Librarian and the Weird Boy, one buffing his allies with support spells while the other throws them into the thick of it. Get em, boys! <laughs> the Eldar receive the Wraith Guard, a slow but devastating infantry unit, while the Tyranids get two new units. Lucky buggers. The Tyrant Guard is a beefy tank unit, which can lock down to regenerate wounds and never seems to fucking die, while Gene Stealers act as a dainty but deadly ambush predator. 
Their inclusion is a no-brainer though. This game adds Space Hulks as a new map type, and no Space Hulk is complete without the bane of all Terminators skulking around it. Dawn of War 2 received several updates before the release of Chaos Rising, with perhaps the biggest one being the Last Stand update. Not that one. It came out with this sick trailer of a Space Marine, Orc Mech, and Eldar Farseer caught in a standoff, until a swarm of Tyranids gatecrashed their little party. This is still pretty accurate, the Farseer spamming Eldritch Storm, the Captain getting caught in friendly fire, and that Orc player is probably level 2 and gonna need reviving soon. Before jumping in, you pick a hero unit, much like the multiplayer, give them some equipment, much like the campaign, and queue up for... an action-based game mode. Yeah, every game is action-based, that could be anything from Supreme Commander to Overcooked. And that's when you load into the match and realise... this is all you're getting. Your hero, your friend's heroes, and some free real estate. Welcome to Wave 1. This is a survival mode. There's no resources to gather or loot to plunder, only 20 waves of themed enemies to fight, which get progressively larger and tougher. Although these waves are predictable, they really ramp up in difficulty, and you're not going to get to the end on your first try. My favourite is Wave 16, which throws nothing at you except for three copies of your heroes. All of your strengths are turned on you, which can make this the hardest wave in the game. New war gear is unlocked to each level up, which aren't strictly better than the old ones. Being higher level just means there's more to choose from, and a chance to create better, stranger, or sillier builds to take to the arena next time. Some heroes have a surprisingly wide range of playstyles. The Captain gets a bolter, melee weapons, jump pack, healing items, even a goddamn plasma cannon to choose from, so he can be anything from a tank buster to a diet apothecary with a dreadnought buddy. Later on, two new heroes will be released, alongside the three amigos. The Hive Tyrant, who can summon other Tyranid units to protect him, and the Chaos Sorcerer, who has this doppelganger ability, which at higher levels can even copy your evil twin on Wave 16. I personally love making my captain an unkillable tank, using the explosive teleport as the mech boy, and making new friends as the sorcerer. We're just clones, sir. We're meant to be expendable. Not to me. If there was a problem with Last Stand, not that one, it's that there is too little of it. Retribution would add one new map as well as three other heroes, but that isn't enough to give this game much longevity. There's no endless horde mode to test your endurance, nor does it offer different wave sets to mix things up, which would have been another way to add some variety. There's tons of discussion about the potential of new heroes for this mode, even if that's just porting over ones from the multiplayer. But as I write this, I'm thinking, how would the campaign characters fare? I want to try and beat this with Cyrus. Still, if you get some friends together and muck around with different builds, you can have a real blast with this. You can even get this on its own on Steam under the name The Last Standalone, which should have gotten it more attention for that pun alone. This game mode fascinates me. The campaign often gets compared to Diablo, but being a top-down game where you control any one hero, it feels like a MOBA? And it released the same month as one of the biggest MOBAs out there. Why didn't this game take off when those did? The Last Stand... Not that one! Okay, I can see why. The name is kind of generic. Maybe Winter Assault is to blame, but I love Arctic environments as a backdrop for Warhammer battles, where the cold is as raw and harsh as the fighting, and the elements bury the futile monuments of combatants in the snow. Lawn 5 does this best in my opinion, but Aurelia is still pretty cool. <laughs> Chaos's influence over the planet forces these massive spikes of ice to pierce the sky like jagged teeth, while bits of the scenery hang ominously in the air. One part of this game I love is how the aftermath of the Tyranid invasion is revisited, the outskirts of Angel Gate are still devastated, with stumps of capillary towers standing among the rubble, and the decisive moments of the last campaign have had monuments erected to your victory. There's also the judgement of Carrion, an enormous husk of an abandoned spaceship often called a Space Hulk, though it isn't as green as the other one. Unless Orcs are on board. The campaign occasionally does some fun stuff with the Space Hulk's tight confines and with creatures trying to ambush you in the roof, but the multiplayer's versions are comparatively bland. Helping to build the atmosphere are the cutscenes, which often look as good as before, though in this one... What the fuck happened to these two? They look like they left their shaders at home. Maybe they're just trying to make a sacrifice for a new graphics card. Returning as this game's composer is Doyle Donahue, who continues his previous great work with new tracks for the Chaos Faction. Heavy drums punctuate much of them beneath deep strings and brass. Distant choirs loom in the background like a cacophony of a thousand damned souls. Using an organ, the most gothic and evil of instruments is beautiful, and I'm pretty sure there's even an electric guitar in there?
The new voice acting is pretty great too. Paul Dobson makes his return as Gabriel and... Wait, then why isn't he voicing Eliphaz? To be fair, Steve Bloom's take on Eliphaz works great for what they were going for with the character. I'm more bothered that he was written like a completely different person. Join the rest of your species in the grave! Scott McNeil returns to voice the Chaos Sorcerer, Fred Tadashaw's Great Unclean One is having a great time, and Alan Sheeran's double duty as both Jonah and the Weird Boy are two wonderful sides of the same psychic coin. But of course, all this talent is nothing compared to the ultimate voice actor, the Wilhelm Scream. I expected Chaos Rising to be a more polished version of its predecessor, and I wasn't disappointed with what I knew was going to be added. But there were still plenty of surprises in store. The corruption mechanic was a really cool way of spicing up the single player, Chaos are a fun faction with more love given to Nurgle and Zinch, and Last Stand proves again that this game's core mechanics are highly versatile. It's worth picking up Chaos Rising if you like Dawn of War 2's campaign, though the multiplayer and Last Stand are better experienced through the next expansion, Dawn of War 2 Retribution. Things can only go up from here for Relic and THQ, and I'm sure if there was a problem, Vanilla Ice would solve it, right guys? Yeah. <laughs>